Hello, everyone. This is Don McAnally with Raymond's Healthcare Management Advisors. I'm joined today with by Carmel Roberts. Carmel is the practice administrator for Valley OB-GYN in Saginaw, Michigan. Hi, Carmel. Thanks for uh, joining me on the discussion today. Hi, Don. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, you know, Carmel, I've been dealing with a lot of clients that are li really looking for different ways to help grow their revenue stream. Um, I think a lot of practitioners for so many years have just relied upon their own two hands, uh, working off their own back, if you will, um, to try to generate fee-for-service revenue. And, uh, you know, we've known for a number of years that that's not the best way to maximize the machine, the practice um, there. Really, it's to try to develop kind of some ancillary service lines, so really some ways that a practice can generate, if you will, some passive income, where perhaps maybe the practitioners aren't the only way to generate revenue within the practice. I know within Valley OB Gin, it's been one of your focus uh, for the last, uh, you know, seven, eight years since you've been there. And I just want to have some discussion today about, you know, the benefits to building up ancillary service lines within a practice and what some of your thoughts are on that. So. Well, again, thank you, Don, for, for having me. And, and you've hit on a topic that I think will become part of, if it's not already, any successful practices toolbox for sure. revenue. Mm -hmm. we, we continue to be uh, in a situation where fee-for-service schedules certainly are not keeping pace with the increased cost of operating in the healthcare environment. It's probably one of the toughest business environments, I would say, to consistently turn a profit because your profit margins are thin to begin with. So your eye naturally turns to, you know, what, what else can I do to make sure that I'm covering my costs and overhead uh, to be able to continue to practice. So mm. I think for us, it was important to go through a bit of a strategic analysis. So number one, uh, really looking at schedules and optimizing schedules. So making sure that we were making effective use of our uh, NPs and our PAs, any of our yeah. um, mid-level providers that we are, you know, able to really optimize the schedule. That's the only thing you're really monetizing is the provider's time. So we started there first and foremost, that we weren't leaving money on the table. Two, we took a look at our patient demographics pretty extensively. Were there things that made, uh, that there were synergies to it built into our specialty or who we were seeing or in our community? Mm -hmm. And so for us, that looked like we added behavioral health. That was a win-win. Um, it was a very good uh, fit. It was a natural synergy to our care plans, but it also gave us, you know, an additional revenue source that we were able to have. It was something that we were outsourcing or that we were referring a lot to. So in an indirect way, I would say, take a look at anything that you're referring out a lot of and, and see if that's something that you could bring in house. Carmel, and what then, about... What about in the, you know, you mentioned things that you're referring out and bringing them back into how, into, into your own camp, into your own clinic, if you will. You know, one of the things I know you and I have had a lot of discussions on is really, uh, you know, in-office procedures. Uh, where maybe in the past there were some things that were maybe done more, I believe, in a hospital or an ASC setting that you guys are able to do uh, in your in your clinic. You know, you know, let's talk a little bit about those types of things and how you can generate some revenue by doing some of those things in your office and still get great patient outcomes. Yeah, that is an, that's an excellent topic. That's something that provides direct and indirect revenue, uh, at least in our case. It does a, a few things like number one, it allows us to really optimize our provider's time, our physician's time, because we're completely in control end to end of that process. We're not at the mercy of block time at a facility uh, and only being able to get in one or two procedures in an afternoon for our doctors. So that, you know, directly had a benefit. Uh, the indirect benefit of it is freeing up their time to be able to do more things. Uh, so we've been able to add additional clinic time 
for mm -hmm. our physicians that we really focus on new patients and new patient annuals. So mm -hmm. when we're getting doctor referrals, they're not waiting um, more than a week or two to be able to get in to see the physician. So it, that, that had a um, really two benefits for it. The third thing that I think really to take a look at, and I don't have actual numbers on it just yet, but I would say that you're in a value-based care environment, you should take a look at it from that angle as well, because you're going to be able to provide the same care at a much lower claim cost overall to the insurance carrier, which is exactly what value-based care is set to do. So that has been something definitely that, that we've seen a benefit. Again, it's, it's still more of a fee-for-service, so it's those ancillary or indirect benefits that I think make it worth it overall. There's not huge profit margins in it, uh, that it's expensive. Anytime you're doing a procedure like that, just the supplies alone tend to be expensive, but you know, you're still making money, you're in control of your schedule, you're able to optimize your schedule and give your provider some much needed time back, and it's helping your value-based care numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, Carmel, one of the things that you do when you when you bring those in-office procedures is you're changing practice patterns to a degree. You're asking clinicians, providers to change the way they do things to a certain degree. And they may have reasons why they enjoyed perhaps relationships at the hospital that they really particularly enjoyed working with certain techs or something. And now you're, you're changing those practice patterns a little bit. Um, did that create any challenges within Valley OB as far as, you know, having the providers uh, change some of their practice patterns in the way that they, the way that they do things? Was there any challenges there that you faced? Not with us. It was something that we, it, the process is something that we engaged in collaboratively. I mean, anytime mm -hmm. you're going to, you know, rearrange a provider's schedule, and certainly if, if you're talking about your highest dollar fee for services, which are surgeries, uh, mm -hmm. by and large, then you definitely need to involve them and make sure that you're not missing any of those subtleties. I mean, that isn't that is a good point that you raised, but that's not a uh, an obstacle that that we face. In fact, it was the opposite. I think that without exception, all of our physicians really enjoy the flexibility and the comfort level of being able to perform those procedures in our clinic. It's like a, a home court advantage, if you will. So really what I'm hearing you say is that yeah, you did it right. You you engage the clinicians at the start of the process right there so that you had their buy-in right from the get-go. And that made the implementation of it that much easier because they were invested in the process and ready to make it ready to make it profitable. I think that's a real key is making sure that your stakeholders are invested right from the right from the first step. I think you're exactly right. That is essential. If you're going to step out of a normal practice pattern and start looking at any kind of ancillary services, it's only as valuable as your provider's willingness to participate in it. Mm -hmm. So another good example for us of an ancillary service is clinical research. Clinical research to us, we view as another, um, another option we have in terms of a plan of care for a patient. Uh, if, if a patient needs um, a particular, some, usually it's pharmaceutical, sometimes it's a durable medical piece of equipment, at least for our specialty. But the advantage there is that it's a win-win for both the patient and the practice. A win for the patient because they're going to get the same care that they would otherwise. They're still going to get whatever treatment it is um, taken care of, but they're going to be compensated for it. So they're not going to have to pay for it. So as we've discussed in other podcasts, you know, that also helps with the self-pay or the high deductible nature of it. But that is a different uh, care plan. It is a different way of practicing. And physicians are creatures of habit. 
you know, I think any professional is. You get into a routine, you hit a stride with it, you know what you're doing, you identify the condition, you treat the condition. So to overcome that natural uh, habit tendencies that all providers have in their care practice patterns, I think involving them is that that's essential. You can't do it successfully without getting their buy-in. You know, getting buy-in really across the organization is key. And Carmel, so much continues to change within the practice of medicine. And, you know, like we talked about earlier, where it was just really, you know, what you could do with your own two hands from fee-for-service environment, now getting into these ancillary service lines. And really, the most progressive practices, those that are on the cutting edge, like you mentioned, are doing these in-office procedures, are looking at doing clinical research. Because I think the patients really do appreciate that. And that's really what you're there for in the end is to take care of people. And I think that, you know, patients, when they come there, you know, and they find that you're doing clinical research, you know, if they've got a particular circumstance that's very difficult and they know that I'm going to be given the best treatment possible, that's got to be a real plus for your practice in helping to establish the brand for Valley ob -Gin. It absolutely is. I think it, to, on a provider level, it's a little counterintuitive, but once you show them the statistics on it, so statistically speaking, our research showed that patients have, you know, upwards of a 73% improved favorability rating towards a provider or a practice that they perceive as pulling out all the stops, that you're giving them the maximum amount of options to be able to address and to treat them. So it's not just the formulaic, um, that could be real versus perceived, but it really does help elevate and give patients the confidence that you are innovative, you're staying up on things, you know, you're going to give them every option that you have at your disposal to make sure that whatever their condition is that needs treating, that you're doing it with their outcome in mind, the patient's outcome in mind. It helps considerably with that relationship. You know, Carmel, I appreciate you taking the opportunity to just talk a little bit about what's the change, what's been happening within Valley OB and just some of the changes within medicine and how the business of medicine and the practice of it's been changing. Thanks a lot for your time. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Don. Mm -hmm.